Hi everyone, your chess puzzler here. And again, what can I say? Welcome to the channel. I have a few pictures for you to view and I hope you can make the connection between them. So let me get started before I get on with today's material. This is picture one. This is picture two. I will leave these pictures up for a few seconds. This is picture number three. This is picture number four. And just concentrate on the kid only. And this is a very famous and well circulated picture. This is picture number five. And we're not looking at the adult, but the kid. And this should be a picture recognisable from the news because it was big news in the United Kingdom. And if you can recognise none of these kids you saw in the picture so far, what about this one? And this is picture number six. And of course his photo and the kids are getting older. Are you able to make the link now that you have seen these pictures? It's all about chess prodigies and there are too many of them around. But what about this kid? Who looks to be in a rather miserable state. He's yet another kid. Only three years old. Okay, okay. By now four. Those tears you see are tears of joy. He was called to exhibit his skills against Karpov and do allow me to bring up a very short clip from the actual footage that was broadcast on the Russian TV. Mikhail is so tiny, he can't even sit on a chair. And this is a point I'm trying to make. Have we seen anywhere in these pictures a world champion or anyone who can become one? I'm sure there are, there are many strong contenders. So both Fabi and Magnus look out for them in the near future. And what I want to look at today is probably two of the biggest names from the photos I've shown. And it is all about these two players, Vincent Kaima and Nihal Sarin. These two are just like playing against an engine. Okay, not quite there yet, and we might be exaggerating, but watch out for these two kids in particular. Who's the better player, and what are the stats when it comes to the individual performance? Using the Relo as a strong indicator, we know one outranks the other by well over 100 points, but let us go and check out their only encounter so far. And we do need to go back to this venue, the Gibraltar Masters of 2018. This is the only time Kaima met Nihal, and this is their round seven game. Okay, and here we go. By the way, who do you think won? <laughs> Mind you, this is not a tricky question. These kids do know their openings and are very strong players. I think when people play against kids, they may know nothing about them and often they underestimate them. And this is where the problem lies. For every game you play, never underestimate your rival. And this is lesson number one. Kaima White got off with one of the most dynamic openings. Knight f3, the red T, and anything that starts from this move can transpose into anything. And this is why it is a very popular opening line for many GMs. D5, D4, 
knight of six, c4, the queen's gambit, and now e6, the semi-slav. And from here, we have the usual responses. The knight comes out, c6, and through this silent e3, and in particular this knight move to d7, we are looking at the Meran, which has been around for years. But today, we also have something called the anti Meran. And it is a move denoted by this bishop move to d3. Not yet in operation, but this is what Vincent came up with in a short while. Kaima came up with this queen move, which is a very normal response. And through bishop e7, b3, castles, and bishop b2, we saw b6. And now that bishop moved to d3 we talked about earlier. There are certain tricks and many options by both sides, but if you do play the queen's gambit, this is one of many board positions you can have. We know why b6 was played, and just in case you wonder, wonder no more. Castles and rook c8, and black is intending to push on with this far. Where the rook is. Rook d1, queen c7, and now rook c1, and you can feel the tension. The game carried on with this queen move, and it was Nihal who made the start. He traded in this guy, and it doesn't really matter that much with what piece you recapture, but we do apply the principles of chess to take from the outside in. Nihal responded with this move trying to force Vincent to react, and he does react. He advanced this guy, and when d5 was removed, how is best for white to recapture if he recaptures? It doesn't matter the slightest. You can take any way you like. Kaime used the knight, and when these pieces came off here, there are certain moves that are not playable, but can you figure them out? This bishop move to c4 is obviously no good. But why go for anything that is not as efficient as this one? And the move Kaima went for is in fact very easy and a pawn is a pawn. It's not just that, but this is quite forcing. He took on h7 and when the king recaptured, his bishop here on d5 also fell. But in fact, there is another move in this position which seems very interesting. You want to try it? Any takers here, please? Knight d4, making use of this pin on the queen. But what now? If bishop f6, which looks decent enough. Now, you can take h7 with a check. And when the king captures, knight b5, leaving only b8 for the queen. Or okay, even b7. Sorry, I didn't say that because there is this knight move to d6 and his mission accomplished for white. And now with the queen having been removed from all the action, this bishop on d5 can also be removed, as we did earlier, but is white as a result of this combo any better off? No, I didn't think so. Bishop takes, and there are many tricks here. Rush and recapture this bishop and you will spoil it. Maybe better to get the rooks together. And whatever you do, black will need to fight hard. Very hard to keep the equality. Okay, back to the game. When the bishop was removed from his post on d5, the rook came under attack and it's all about where this rook goes. But do we really need to consider a rook move or can we come up with this knight check first. You might in fact be causing more trouble or more damage if you like than anything else because you're giving the king an extra tempo to go back into hiding and without a good reason. Kaima moved the rook out of danger and when the queen pursued him, knight h4 may be something to consider but I'm not very hopeful about it because Black is always going to go for a queen trade before he tries anything else. 
time it covered by thrusting this guy forward. And we know the king moved back into hiding. And this is how we saw the game unfold. Using the bishop on this strong outpost on b2, Kaime went for it. He chased after the queen, trying to get her away from these central files. And Nihal does exactly this. He got his big lady to challenge the other big lady. And it's all down to white, whether he wants the queens off or not. And this is a time where you come in to improvise. With white to move, any ideas what it's best to go for in two, one, and pause. Rook c2 is available, and so is rook e1, which is such a second-rated move. Try and work out why this does not work. Okay, this is what Kaime came up with. Queen to c4, and if you want the bishop, just take him, and this is what happens. Queen takes f7, check, and after king h7, nothing else. This is what white has, which may be easier than you think. Anyone? Not queen takes bishop, because you will buy the farm, but this. This is the magic move. Forget taking the rook on c1, because when you do, and the king hides away, you will have no more checks. What black is looking at is this weak spot on g7. And the only way to cover is to get the bishop here. And after this knight move, what a beauty of a response this is. If rook d7 going after the queen, the knight can remove this bishop with a check. Only when the king moves to the corner of the board, there is knight takes rook. And this game is over in just about five, six, or even seven moves max. Okay, with this rook coming off on c1, maybe you want to add two or three moves extra, and that will be it. Okay, let's come back to the game to see how these manage the game. And here it was where we left it at. Before the queen is able to remove this bishop, black must secure f7. And this is what Nihal did. He summoned the rook to block the access to f7. And I guess even if you go for the knight, can we see how to continue from here? b5. And only when the queen takes, this knight now is free to jump into e4, and the position may just look equal. It's hard to say, but I would prefer to continue with the white pieces. I don't like the king being so exposed, but this position is very complex, as there are plenty of pieces that are not very well covered. But this is it. When the rook was called into block f7, Kaime pushed his queen back to cover for the bishop, and now when the queen's departed, bishop d6, which was not the strongest response in this position because what happens when you allow the knight to go after the bishop? And the thing is, Kaime missed it, and he may pay the price for this. He went for h3, and now he falls a move too short. After b5, the bishop returned to base. And here comes this guy into c4, and boy, black is going to push, push, push. King g2 got this guy advancing too. And when the king made his way up the board, somebody is in trouble. But can you see who from the two? When Nihal found this rook move, somebody was going to get hurt big time. There are three pieces attacking. And there are two pieces covering, so we know something has to give. How on earth did Kaima get himself into this pickle is a mystery. And the problem with this type of pin is that white can't even move the knight, because the rook is going to come off with a check, and this might just as well explain Vincent's follow-up response. He opted for this rook exchange sack, and there is a reason for it. And this tells you how positional Kaima is. He saw he was in trouble, and yet he tried to trick Nihal. So, guys, do you remove anything from the board? And if so, what? There are two pieces up for grabs. Take one, and you will win. Take the other, and you will allow black to get back, right back into the game. Do you want to spend a few seconds to try and work this one out? 
the move is G takes rook, but after the knight attacks his rook, you will realize it is black who has a problem because not only the rook is under attack, but there is a nasty fork lurking in the background. So given one is greedy and removes the rook first, this is unfortunately not the move you should be going for. So let's get these pieces back to where they came from and try this now. And this is the right move, by the way. Bishop takes knight and only, and only when the bishop eliminated this bishop, only now the rook was removed and black is now clearly winning. Kaime also went on to remove f6 and now the mist is finally lifting. Right now, the only danger black faces is when this rook on c1 is somehow able to squeeze into the king's side and then we would have a mate, but this is provided we're looking at some miracle. It is simply impossible for this rook to get even out from where he is, so this is not even a possibility. Nihal was beginning to relax here, as much of the work was already done. B4, at best, got this rook attacked, but is this a credible threat? Getting me into the white squares, where no bishop can go, got the king moving south, and there came this guy storming down the board. And you tell me how white is to even going to stop them. You will be able to stop one or two, but not the whole lot. King d2 got the rook behind b4, and when Kaima had gone for this move, he knew it was all a matter of time, or moves if you like. a3 led to the king to move even further west, and if you don't want to rush, you can do exactly what Nihal did. King to h7. And when he gets closer, what else do you want? f4, f5, and g5 got the king even closer, and now this rook on c1 would want to be everywhere, but he can safeguard the queen side or the king side, but not both parts of the board in one go. Kaima squeezed in this check, and when the king took, this was the break Kaima was looking for. A rook check, and if you now get this king to back off, you will pay the price when the rook comes in with a full up check. And if this rook on c6 drops, it will be black who will be in trouble. Of course, the king came south. And even here, look at what Kaima comes up with. Take this guy and what is resurrected because committing such an error is all white needs. A rook check, king h5, rook h1 check. And this is a perpetual unless you're willing to hand over your rook, which you will not because it would be black who is now going to lose the game. And this is all you need. Obviously, and very correctly spotted, the king could also move into f3, but this is what Nihal did. And when the king was pushed back to the first rank, c3 in the end is near. Takes, and now c2 check got the king to start swinging, and when b3 also came flying off, Kaime never gives up, despite him being in a losing position. He tried it, and why not? And now if you get your rook to base to stop this guy, it will be too late. Not rook h8, but a direct g8 queen. And when the rook captures, there comes this lovely check on g1, and it will be again white snatching this game away just as easily. But after g7 and being at the brink of promotion, there is one move in this position and Nihal is on fire. The continuation may not be as straightforward for some. King d2 is forced and then rook back to c8 and this time things do work for black. Rook c1 was in time to stop the promotion but after takes and takes, there came this guy wanting so much to transgender into a brand new queen. And it's now a matter of a max of five to six moves. Bishop e5, king f3, bishop back to d4, and king e4, 
and Kaima didn't wait any longer and did something he doesn't do very often. He resigned. And this is the only game Kaima played against Nihal. But are these two some great warriors? Even when Kaima went wrong, he still came up with some very interesting responses. But is Nihal a much better player? Not necessarily, but at least in this game, it was Nihal the much stronger party. For sure, Vincent is looking for a sweet revenge when the two meet again, whenever that time comes. I do have a feeling these two, in particular at some stage, will be fighting also for the world title one day. Who knows? I shall be here to keep you up to speed. For sure, the prodigies we saw today, and I'm talking about all those kids featured, with the exception of one who's not a kid anymore, every single kid we've seen is a potential world title holder. I shall be here to keep you up to speed. So until next time, this was your chess puzzler.